Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Modern App Development on Salesforce. We are developer advocates here and thank you so much again for joining us today. My name is Mohit. I'm a developer advocate here at Salesforce and I have been joined today by my friend uh, Julian. Julian, over to you. Hello Mohit, how you are doing? And hello everybody that is joining us live on Trailhead. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, you all on this episode of Modern App Development on Salesforce platform. And today we are going to learn a lot about packaging, both Node.js applications and JavaScript uh, modules, and also Salesforce packages. My name is Julian Duque. I'm also a lead developer advocate here at Salesforce, working mainly with the Heroku team, and I am your JavaScript guy. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julian. Um, I just want to remind everyone uh, that we are a publicly traded company. So here's a forward looking statement. Please do not make any purchasing decision on anything forward looking statement that we make in this uh, presentation. Uh, now with that, Julian, so we are almost coming to an end, you know, of modern app development on Salesforce series. Now, if you have not uh, sort of joined us from uh, starting, you can find all of our recordings on Trailhead Live website and also on our YouTube channel. I'll post the link to our YouTube channel and the playlist. So we have on demand recorded all our content. Uh, we will be left with only one session next week. That will be, uh, you know, where we will be helping you understand building CI CD pipelines for Salesforce application, also using Heroku pipelines and, uh, uh, you know, all of the goodness of continuous integration there. Now, uh, you know, let's, let's start today's presentation and Julian, uh, you know, would you like to take control and walk sure, us sure. through I node packaging? Of course, I want to say something before starting the uh, topic today. Uh, next week, it's going to be the end of modern app development series, but now the end of the content we are creating. So uh, stay tuned. I will start an introduction to Node.js for Salesforce developers on January 21st. So uh, I'm expecting also Mohit joining me on other on 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 some episodes on, on that series. I will be doing episodes with Alba Rivas also, and I I'm pretty sure Mohit is going to uh, keep creating awesome content for you all. So stay tuned for content we are going to be creating for you. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, okay. So Julian, um, over to you. Okay. Let me get some coffee so I have the energy to start with this topic that I'm very passionate about it. So today we are going to learn how to create an NPM package. So first and foremost, what is NPM? NPM is the JavaScript package registry. It's where all of the different Node.js and JavaScript packages lives. Currently, NPM is the largest package repository out there. It has way more packages than other different platforms and languages. And there you can find almost anything. If you need a database driver, if you, if you need a library to create awesome 3D graphics or to do charts or to generate PDFs, those are going to live on NPM. So normally, um, Let's uh, uh, create packages from the perspective of, of Node.js. You will need to have Node.js installed in your computer. NPM, the package manager, comes included with Node.js. So when you install Node.js, you also are going to have NPM. And the best way to start creating an NPM package is to create an NPM project. So first, if we want to publish this package, we will need to create an NPM account. So you are going to go to npmjs.com slash sign up, and you only need to provide three things, your username, the email address, and the password. With this, you have an account, it is free, and after you create the account, you will be able to publish packages, and all of other developers are going to be able to use those packages. The idea is that, the, is that these packages are going to be open source, so you are also, uh, participating of the open source ecosystem. Other developers can use your code and can contribute back to what you are doing. So first step, go and create an NPM account. So let me go to the browser. I already have my, my account, so I'm not going to create another one. 
So you go to the browser, mp mpmjs.com, click on sign up, and here you are going to fill out this uh, form. Second, and this is very recommended, not needed, but very recommended, it's to enable two-factor authentication. This is to ensure that the packages you are going to publish are going to be yours. There has been some issues in the past. Some module authors didn't have a two-factor authentication enabled that for some reason they were victims of a vector attack and malicious people got over their accounts and they published, let's say, a version of a very popular package with some sort of uh, virus or Trojan or we have seen like Bitcoin miners or crazy stuff. So please, please, please make sure to enable two-factor authentication so your packages are going to be secure and your account is going to be secure. So now that we have an account, next we will need to create an NPM package. So an NPM package is the same as a Node.js application. You will need to create a folder. In the folder, you will need to have a file called the package.json. And the package.json contains the metadata for a JavaScript or Node.js project. Information like the name, the description, the author, uh, the version, which is very important when publishing packages to NPM. Uh, what are the production dependencies, the development dependencies, scripts, and more information that we are going to be taking a look. Uh, the best way to create a package JSON is to run npm init. npm init is going to show you like a small wizard uh, steps on the CLI, it's going to ask a couple of questions and then it's going to create the package JSON for you. Second, similar to the git ignore file or the force ignore file, there are things that we don't want to add to the package we are going to publish to npm. For example, a .m file. On the .m file, we have a lot of secrets environment variables that might contain sensitive information that we don't want to leak into the public registry. Remember, all of the packages we publish are going to be accessible to all the people on the internet. So don't include like uh, API keys, AWS secrets, or sensitive information. This is why you are going to be using the npm ignore file. The npm ignore file follows the same uh, syntax of other ignore files like force ignore or git ignore. And there you are going to add the packages, uh, the files. You don't want them to be on the public registry. Then you might be interested in having a preview of the package that you are going to publish. This is where the npm pack command is useful. npm pack is going to create a torball file with the files that are going to be pushed into npm. So this is just to do a local preview and make sure you are not adding any file that must not be on the public cloud. And last but not least, you need to run npm publish to submit the package to npm. I forgot one step and one very important step here is that before publishing, you will need to do an NPM login. So you are logged into NPM from your computer and you have access to publish a package under your username. Then um, if we publish a package, then we will need, uh, we might want to update the package, add more features. So we can also use the NPM version command to bump the package version. Pardon. One recommended way of manages version on NPM is to follow the Sember standard. Quiet. So Sember or oh, semantic versioning, you can find the website at sember.org, is a versioning um, convention that uses three numbers. The first number uh, means the major version, the, min the second number means the minor version, and the third number means the patch version. So pretty much the major, you are going to change the major when you make incompatible API changes. Let's say you change the name of a method or you uh, remove a feature, something that is going to break that module for other people. 
A minor version, pretty much, you are going to add functionality that it's backwards compatible and is mm -hmm. not going to break the package. And patch, pretty much, when you are fixing bugs or uh, improving things without uh, messing with the API. So it is a recommended way, and you are going to see almost the most of the packages that are published to npm follow Ember. Yeah, uh, yeah. Julian. Do you have yeah. a question? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I do have one uh, question here, not question, maybe a comment. So yeah. so Julian, so you talked about SEM versioning, um, and it is exactly same we recommend even with Salesforce packages. I just wanted to bring that up. Uh, you know, it, when we look into Salesforce packages, that's that's exactly what you described. Like, you know, when you have a breaking change, right? Go for a major version. When you have a, a you know a minor fix, then go for minor. When you have like uh, just a you know a patch to say you you go for patch, right? So minor is essentially like let's say it's not breaking change, but you have added like you know a small feature or something. It's not it's not a lot of change to your package. So I just want to say that in Salesforce we follow the same thing, and the reason why and and Julian maybe we need to clarify this a bit. Uh, you know we started with Node and explaining packages. The reason why uh, I thought that we will go and explore Node packages before we explore Salesforce packages is because a lot of the concepts are actually taken from there, especially like SEM versioning, uh, you know, why we need packages, right? Uh, so all of those goodness in Salesforce world comes from some of the uh, the Node.js packages. So uh, so it's important to Node, uh, you know, to know how to package in Node, uh, you know, and uh, I, I hope that it's also helpful, you know, if you're building like large scale JavaScript applications. Perfect. Thank you for the clarification. And yes, let's continue with a couple more things about npm and then on our activity we are going to create a module we are going to publish that module and you will be able to use it uh, right now from your computer so let's continue then and I, I think this is very important is to show you the types of npm packages so normally the packages that you are going to find are considered on a scoped public packages. So pretty much a non-scoped public package is a package that is uh, published by an author, like a module author. It can have like multiple contributors. Like there are like there are packages that have like multiple people that have access to that package and can publish versions of that package. So a public package is available to all users. Everybody can install it and can use it. Uh, they must have a unique name, and I'm going to be discussing uh, naming conventions later. And some examples of public packages that you are going to find uh, out there are, for example, Express, which is a web framework, also Fastify, another web framework, or Moment, which is a daytime uh, library that helps you with date formatting and that kind of stuff. So you recognize a public package because it has just a single name, a simple name, right? Then right. you are going to find a scoped public packages. So organizations or developers or certain groups uh, prefer to have their packages under one scope. This is kind of like, an, like a specific namespace. These scoped public packages are also available to all users but they are published under a specific scope name space. Mm -hmm. They will require an NPM organization. This is free. So you, you will be able to uh, publish a package under an organization or under your username. For example, if I'm doing a fork of Moment and I'm adding certain features, but I am not a Moment contributor, I can publish the moment package under my scope. Mm -hmm. For example, at Julian Duke slash moment. It will be my own version of moment. It has a unique name because it's under my scope. And that means I'm just pretty much forking and republishing a package. But other developers are going to see that that's Julian Duke version of moment. They also need to have a unique name. And some examples, and this might be familiar to you all, are uh, add LWC engine or LWC compiler. 
Those are modules under the LWC organization, or for example, foreman under the Heroku organization. So some organizations have like this way of managing the packages. Also, NPM, NPM has a lot of uh, open source packages that are available for everybody, but you can also publish private packages to NPM. And this is more for enterprises that are building code that are not going to be distributed for everybody, but just being used internally in their projects. So you will need to have an NPM paid organization. So you will need to pay for an enter NPM enterprise version. And these packages can also be a scoped, use it as scope or don't have any scope at all. The difference is that when we are publishing and when we are installing, we are not fetching the packages from the public registry, but from the specific private registry. And that's going to be the difference. NPM used to be like an independent company. Right now is part of GitHub. So GitHub and Microsoft are the owners of NPM. And some package name guidelines. So when you choose a name for your package, remember that the name needs to be unique. Also, I know this is one of the hardest thing in computer science naming, but the name needs to be descriptive. You are going to tell your developers pretty much with the name what that package does and also needs to meet the NPM policy guidelines. So I, I added a link on the, on the bottom where you can take a look at those policy guidelines. But for example, don't use uh, offensive names right. or do not use somebody else trademark because that's bad. I mean, you it's going to be bad if you publish packages on their Salesforce or using the Salesforce name because you don't own that tra trademark. And also uh, don't don't go against the, the law. Another uh, thing is um, don't publish things that are already owned by somebody else or don't do package squatting. Package squatting is when you publish a package with a name that is similar to the, for example, to a popular package just to confuse or to use it maliciously. Sometimes you're going to find some packages that it changes a couple of, of letters. That's for, I mean, I, I a lot of the times I'm a little bit dyslexic and I change letters and I might install a package that it's malicious instead of the package I'm intended to install. So that's also uh, NPM and the security groups around NPM are doing a lot of work, hunting down those packages, but you are going to be a good actor and you are going to publish packages with original names, unique and descriptive names. Okay, I think that's uh, pretty much all of the different guidelines why we don't go to the activity and do a live demo to create and publish an NPM package. Awesome. Perfect. So let me get back here to my, to my terminal. I'm on an empty folder and I'm going to create a package to greet trailblazers. So I'm going to create that package. Let's create a folder, make there. Trailblazers Greeter. Trailblazers Greeter. So remember that the first step is to uh, run npm init, right? npm yep. init is going to initialize my project with a package JSON. And it's asking for some information. So what's the package name? It is Trailblazers Greeter. Let's hope right. that package is unique. Uh, the version, let's start with the default version, 1.0.0. 1, 1 mm -hmm. A description, a CLI utility, utility to greet trailblazers, right? The entry point is going to be the main file of my package. It's going to be index.js. I don't have a test, so I'm mm -hmm. not adding test, but it is recommended to a test. Remember, we talk about you can use Jest or other test runner for this application. Uh, Git repository. Let's say I'm going to publish this to Git under my username, mm -hmm. uh, which is Julian Duque. 
Trailblazers, Griever. Some keywords, uh, CLI, Trailblazers. This is to help people find my package when searching on NPM. Mm -hmm. uh, Greeter text. And the author, this is me, Julian Duque, and I'm adding my public email here because that's the email associated with my uh, NPM account. And very important, the license. Mm -hmm. So there are a bunch of different open source licenses out there. You can go to opensource.org to, to read more about licenses. By default, they are using the ISC license. I'm more fan of the MIT, but you can use the license that fits your purpose. So now you can see a preview of the package JSON. This is the package JSON that is going to be written on the folder. And Got let's it. enter. Yes, I have a package. Now I can open um, Visual Studio Code to start coding. So one best practice is to create a readme file. The readme file is going to be good for GitHub, but also is going to be rendered on the search page of your package on NPM. So let's start by creating a readme.md mm -hmm. using markdown. Let's add a title, Play Trailblazers Greeter a CLI utility to greet. I love your package Blazer. name. I love your oh. package name. Thank you. Let's hope it is not a trademark violation, but I hope not. If there is a problem, I can unpublish my package. I have 24 hours to do it. Okay. Uh, NPM have a restriction when you publish a package. You have 24 hours to remove it. Mm -hmm. After the 24 hours, the package is going to be locked. This is to prevent things like the left pad incident that happened quite Fire. a while. I'm not sure if you are aware, Mohit, of what happened, but a developer had a very simple uh, dependency that was spread it all over the internet. Oh, and wow. in a matter of protest, he decided to take down that package, breaking huh. internet. <laughs> so <laughs> it was, uh, it, it, it's called the left path incident. You can find it on Google and have a quick law. Oh, okay. okay. And also in the readme, uh, you will need to provide. So install, how to install the package. So you install it by doing npm install. This is a global package, I and mean, I'm going to show you what that means. Greeter and usage. You can do something like this, for example, MPX, Trailbed Lasers Greeter, and at the end, add license MIT. Mm -hmm. It can be more complete, but for time purposes, uh, we are going to keep it that way. Okay. Remember, I told you the main file is going to be index.js. So let's create that file, index.js. And this is going to be useful when you have a library. When you're publishing a library and people import your package, it will require this file. Mm -hmm. But we are not building a library. We are building a CLI tool. So we are going to change main with bin. S represents a binary. What is the binary that I'm going to run when executing this uh, greeter? Got right it. now we are creating a CLI tool. Okay. So let's start. I'm going to be adding uh, something called the hash bank. This mm -hmm. is for Unix environments and the Node.js runtime. Also interpret this on, on, on Windows if I'm not wrong. So the hash bank, uh, user bean and node. That means this package is a node.js binary. Binary, okay. And now what I'm going to be doing is uh, create a console log. Console log, hello, trail, lasers. Mm-hmm. And that's it. I'm creating the most basic Hello World application. So let's see, uh, before 
pushing this to to npm let's do something let's try to test this locally so i'm going to be adding some uh permissioning execution permissions to the command mm -hmm. and run that as a command it works it shows hello trailblazer so i'm running this as a command i can also execute it using node mm -hmm. it works it does the hello world yeah uh, but how can I run it as a command? What I can do is something like npm link dot. It's going to link my project into my local npm folder. And now I might have a trailblazers reader command. Okay. Got it. So this, is, this is a local command that I just installed. Okay. We have not published this to NPM. We have done anything, okay? Makes sense. Now, let's publish it. What we need to do? First, check if we are logged in into NPM. So I'm going to be doing a NPM who am I? And it says, hey, you need to authenticate. This command requires you to be logged in. Okay, okay. let's log in. NPM login is going to ask for my username, my password, which is something like this, my email, which is public, uh, public, so it is this one. Mm -hmm. And remember that I told you to enable the two-factor authentication, so I need to get my phone, check for my code, and you can see the code in there. Okay. Hope it works. Now I am logged in as Julian Duque to the public registry, which is registry.npmjs.org. Yeah. Let's run npm. Who am I again? I am logged in. Mm -hmm. Since I don't have any secrets, I don't need to add the npm ignore file. So I'm good. And let's do an npm publish. Sounds okay. good. Yeah. NPM publish. Now it is asking me again for my OTP, for my code. Let's wait until it refreshes. Okay. C601, 645. It's going to do the publish. And I publish Trailblazers Greeter with version 1.0.1. Got it. Let's let's go to npm to see if the package is in there. Where is my 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 Chrome? There you go. Oh, here. It was on full screen. Yeah. So let's go to npm. Mjs.com. Search for packages. Trailblazers greeter. There you go. Finished or published a few seconds ago. Trailblazers Greeter, a CLI utility to greet Trailblazers, how to install it, how to use it, the license, keywords, who created the package, the repository, and the size, and that's it. That's what we did. I can also explore. Oh, it is exclusive to teams. Sadly, um, I don't have a team. But you can take a look at the versions, who depends this package, what dependencies I'm using. And that's how we publish the package. But now, I, I, I think this is very boring. I, I, it is not doing anything interesting. So let's okay. change it a little bit. Okay. So let me also show you MPX. What is MPX? MPX is an utility that you can use to execute packages without installing those packages globally. So if All I right. run MPX and the name of the package, mm -hmm. it will execute it. So right now I have it, I have it, I have it linked. So let me do the unlink, remove the package from my local. Yeah. Now try it from the remote. So it is going to fetch the package and it will install the package, run it, and then this this is being kept on the cache. Got so it. So it is not installed it as a global package. Or you can run npm install dash g or dash dash global, and it will install it as a command. Okay, let's add a little bit more fun to this package. What I want to do is use this module that colorize the output 
like mm -hmm. as a rainbow because I, I like rainbows. They look cool. So I'm copying the name of this package and I'm doing npm install rainbow. So I'm using another dependency. There you go. Now you see on the package JSON, we have a new dependency mm -hmm. and a node modules folder with the new dependency we added. Got it. Okay. And now we are going to get that rainbow require rainbow that's how it works right rainbow yep. require and then using this module rainbow dot rainbow yeah to colorize my output so before polishing you are going to run your tests so run the test yep oh look at that oh it works it will change the color. Uh huh. That's that's cool. Every time I run it, cool, cool, cool. Very uh, cool. Now let's uh, bump a version. So okay. a good practice is to have this package on a Git repository. I don't have this package on a Git repository, so I'm going to do a Git in it. Yeah. Now that I'm on a Git repository. Uh, I'm going to be doing npm version okay. minor. Mm -hmm. It will bump to a minor version. And it automatically bumps, right, Julian? Like you don't have yeah. to go and change it in the package.json. Okay, that's interesting. No, it automatically go to the package.json, bumps it. And if I'm not wrong, it creates a tag. Okay. And a commit. Got it. So, right, so let me do a git add. Git commit my new file. Okay, perfect. I should I, I should have added initially to Git and then running the the version bump. Got it. But that 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 works. That works. I bump the package, then npm publish. And now it's gonna push ask, the ask me security again for the code. <laughs> yeah, security. Security always, always. Always, you know, always we recommend that you enable. Now I want to pitch here that you know, even in Salesforce, we always recommend holy on to enable multi-factor authentication for your Rx. Uh, you know, security is very important. Very important. If I refresh, now we have a different version. We have one dependency. Mm -hmm. And now we can see the two versions and Perfect. all the version story. And if I execute npm, the Trails Blazers greeter. Uh -huh. Awesome. This is awesome. What is what is my color? Oh, maybe it's getting from the catch. One execute the one point one point zero version. Now there you go. There it you is go. running the one we created. Yeah, there's a bug there. Yeah, maybe it is the catch. It is not updating yet. Now it is updated. Got it. We are doing everything like in real time, so <laughs> it might need some time to propagate. But yes. it is it is it is working as you can see. My package is published. And then we can do a bunch of different stuff with this package. And this is just a CLI tool. But yeah. now let's do something else. Do you have a question? Mo? Yeah, yeah. You know, I was just going to pitch here that, you know, even in Salesforce, right, today, like when you do your development, right, you have package.json. You know, the moment you create your SFDX project, you have your package.json and that has all the dependency. And this is how these things are built. You know, what Holion is showing you is from scratch, like how to build and publish a package. But, you know, we, we leverage a lot of package that is already available, uh, you know, open source for building our right. tools like Salesforce CLI or our Salesforce extension VS Code package, or, uh, you know, as a, as a matter of fact, you know, for all our, e, you know, sample gallery apps like eCars, we, we use a lot of these open source packages. Exactly. So now let's uh, do something more uh, interesting. I'm, I'm on eCars, right? Yep. Okay. Remember that we have been speaking and talking a lot about the eCars project, and eCars have a lot of. Uh, let me. Uh, oh, what I'm doing? That's not what I wanted to do. This is what I. Okay, this is full screen for some reason, but okay, don't worry. Um, 
e-cars have a lot of local packages. Remember yes. that we have this apps folder where we are using all of the different Eroku applications. They are hosted in this folder. Here we have an application called eCars Real Time. eCars Real Time have all of the different utilities for the real time aspects of eCars. One of those utilities is the one that uh, acts as the MQTT client. Got it. Which is the eCars MQTT agent. The eCars MQTT agent is a, a little bit more complex module that exports a, an agent class that can create a car simulator. Mm -hmm. So pretty much that library is being used on the sensor simulator. Yep. As you can see, we are exporting um, the eCars MQTT agent class as a local yep. module. I'm going to show you on the package JSON how this looks as a local module. And here we are spawning uh, multiple agents. We connect to a server and we simulate the connection. Quiet. So simulate is going to simulate a lot of sensor information and act as if this were a running car. What we are going to do right now is to turn this module in here into an NPM package. And then we are going to replace it here and see how can we use it. So. First, let me show you the package JSON of this application. We are using local packages. So right now that eCars MQTT agent refers to a file inside my uh, file system into in the folder in the packages folder, eCars MQTT agent uh, package. If you see a version in this case, or a version range using these like special symbols, this is a convention in Sember that will make sure that you are not installing breaking packages, that at least is going to take changes on the minor and patch uh, areas of Got the Sember version segment, not the ma major versions. Uh, if you see a version, it will try to fetch this package from NPM, but if you see like a new URL, it could be from Git or a local uh, folder, uh, the package is going to come from somewhere else. So let's do the exercise to publish the eCars MQTT agent as a public package. Okay. So if I go to the package JSON, you are going to see something here. This package is private. Mm -hmm. If for some reason, I go to that folder. Let me go to uh, apps, eCars real time packages, eCars MQTT agent. If for some reason I run npm publish, it will say, hey, this package has been marked as private. Got it. Second, the name has a scope. And I am not using a scope on my NPM organization. I am not the owner of the eCars scope and I don't want to use the scope. Mm -hmm. So before publishing this package, what I want to do is to change the name. All right. It's going to be uh, JDook eCars MQTT agent. Just to keep a very unique name so it is not going to collide with any other package we might want to publish in the future. All right. Second, remove the private because we want to publish it and see that it is exporting this as a library. So the main file is going to be live agent, which is this agent file. So this agent file is the one that we are pretty much exporting. So it is a class mm -hmm. called agent that extends an even emitter. And here at the end, I am exporting that class as a module. Module. So I'm okay. using module.exports to export uh, uh, a JavaScript module using CommonJS. We are not using ECMAScript modules here, but you can use them. They are supported on, on, on Node. And that's only the two changes we need to do to publish this. Correct. So now we can run npm publish get my phone ready yeah enter the code 
enter. And since we don't have like any private dependency right now, the eCars agent has been published. Awesome. Me... I lost. Oh, okay. There you go. Let me copy this. Get back to Chrome. Find my package. Search. It is maybe not loading yet. Uh, maybe you just have to reload it, Julian. Yeah. Sometimes okay. it might take it might take some time. It, it takes to, some time to refresh. Yeah. I'm I'm pushing the the registry now. It there works. you go. There you go. But remember, I'm not following all of the good practices. I don't have a readme, so this is why we don't have a readme here. But we can see that this package has like three different dependencies and one version, and that's how we publish the package. And if we want to use this package on the sensor simulator, what we do is go to the eCars project. It's yeah. here on real time and do an npm install eCars MQTT agent. It will fetch that version, install it. I'm pushing internet right now. Yeah, you this are. Why taking taking some time? Yeah, you are. But then, after I install it, I can go to my sensor simulator file and replace yeah. the local module with the one I just installed, and the code will work as it Fine. is. I just publish a local package to npm, and that will work for sure. Perfect. So, Mo, that's pretty much all the content I had. Okay. Uh, at the end, you are going to find some resources with more best practices around creating uh, JavaScript and uh, Node.js packages, how to publish to NPM, uh, the package conventions, the different types of packages you can uh, create and publish to NPM. And stay tuned for the upcoming introduction to Node.js for Salesforce developers, where I will be covering more of these type of topics. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julian, for explaining that whole Node concept and whole Node packaging. Now let's switch gears a bit to Salesforce world. Uh, you know, I want to talk about Salesforce packages. So, uh, you know, you saw this concept of SEM versioning, you know, uh, you also saw how Julian was creating packages, right? In Salesforce world, we package not just the code, like in Julian's, you saw it was just, you know, all JavaScript code. In Salesforce world, we have this metadata, right? So the moment you do declarative changes to your R, the metadata gets created and you can package them, right? So in Salesforce world, uh, Julian, there's two types of development models. You know, one is uh, org based where what we, ask users is, you know, use org as your, uh, you know, uh, as your truth, you know, source of truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have package-based development, which is the source of truth is your Git repository, okay? And so that you can recreate your app. Now, Salesforce already has a lot of out-of-box objects, features, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, out-of-box uh, process automations, et cetera, right? So a lot of times it does not make sense to have a package, right? Uh, you know, it can exist in an org and that's what org-based development is. So for example, if you're cu customizing the out-of-box sales cloud or service cloud and you're, you know, just adding few metadata types, like for example, I can give an example, uh, metadata type of, let's say, uh, you know, something like, uh, uh, you know, a record type or a standard page layout, right? We do not actually uh, publish them, um, you know, as a package. It's all just configured in the org. But let's imagine that, uh, you know, you are doing a custom application development. That's where we need to make sure to use package-based uh, development. So, um, you know, again, uh, what is package in Salesforce context? It's a container of metadata. It consists of related metadata, right? For a package to deploy, it must all com compile with, uh, you know, dependencies and it must validate. And also when working with Salesforce DX source format, we usually map the package to a project workspace directory. And that's very important. And I'm gonna show you how to uh, 
uh, do that. Now, Julian, I want to skip all the slides just in the interest of time. Uh, you know, I'm gonna straight away go and create some packages for the eCars application. And then probably because the package creation is asynchronous and takes time, we can come back and visit some of our slides. Um, so with that, let's actually go to the eCars. So again, this is an uh, eCars application. Uh, you can download from our sample gallery apps, GitHub repository. I have the links already there for you in the chat. Now, the way uh, you can, uh, let's start creating a package, right? So a very important thing to note there when you create a package is, so just like you have package.json, right? Uh, for node projects that, uh, you know, Julian walked us through, there is an SFDX project.json, okay? So this is the, the file that is responsible for having all the parameters like the versions of the package, you know, uh, dependencies, you know, just like how we have, uh, you know, package.json, but this is for Salesforce project. So Julian, why don't we create now? Uh, so let's create a package. So uh, to create a package, right, um, I'm gonna bump my terminal so that you all can easily see. So to create a package, right, we have this uh, force package namespace, right? So you can do a help on it if you like first time exploring this namespace and this uh, stuff, right? Uh, now, before that, I want to mention that I have already sort of authenticated to a dev hub, and this is very important. So you have to authenticate to the dev hub. Uh, we showed that in the first session, and you have to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, the packaging is enabled there in the org. So there's a setting there that you have to enable, and we explained about what is dev hub, how to authenticate, etc. all of them in our first session. So once you have that, there is this package, force package create command. So we're gonna use that command now. So we're gonna say force package create, okay? And then, so we can do a force package create, and then let's do a help on it because, you know, Julian, I don't also remember the complete command. Mm -hmm. um, so here's an example that they give us, right? So let's actually try to follow that example. So the name of the package, why don't we call it as eCars or Pulsar's eCars maybe, yep. Julian? I'm very bad at naming. Let's say Pulsar it, eCars. It's hard, it's hard. It's hard, it's hard, yeah. So let's say Pulsar eCars app is our name of the application. And then the type, this is very important. We have two types, manage packages and unlock packages. Manage packages specifically if you are building for app exchange and the code is locked there. So your subscribers installing this package will not be able to see any code behind it. So you IP protect your code basically. Uh, but for now, we're just gonna use unlock packages. Unlock packages is for customers. There are two variations to it. I will talk about them shortly if I get time, otherwise I have the slides. Uh, and then very important is you have to say which directory you are creating this. That's very, very important. And uh, that's a required parameter. So I'm gonna say force app because that's the directory. Now you can have multiple packages and they can be in different directories. All that you need to do is when you're creating a package, provide that. So now once we have that, Julian, we just say enter, right? And it's gonna be very fast. We should see the package created, right? So now we have the package and you see the package directory got modified. We have the package name. We have the version number, or, or sorry, the version name that you can change and the version number right? So it's starting with 0.1.0.next. So we have this next keyword. What it means is next time when you create the package, it will automatically sort of increment. So, so we have the package. Think of package as like a, a, you know, like a tree, right? And then package versions, think of it as a branches, right? So it's not, the, so we create the package and then we create different versions underneath it, right? And that's the version number, right? So when you say next here, it means that next time when I create a package version number, it will be 0.1.0.1. Next time it will be 0.1.0.2, like that. So that's the next version. And you can change the version as well here, right? And it automatically created a package ID also, right? So we created the package. Now, what is our next step, right? So our next step is to obviously create a version, okay? So how do we create uh, the version? Again, we have this command, sfdx force, uh, instead of just package, we're gonna say package version create, right? Um, and that's gonna require the package ID, 
And where do we get that package ID from? From the package aliases. So, so this is the package ID that you need. And then one more thing is you can specify and password protect your package, you know, security. So uh, let's say, Julian, you know, uh, we have this parameter called K where you can put your password if you want. Uh, that way, when somebody is installing, it will ask for the password. It's a security feature. While if it is an open source project, Julian, you can just, you know, publish it. Uh, you know, without the, the password, right? So the, for that, you have to specify X. Now we execute this and this process takes time because it has to, you know, sort of validate the, the metadata, compile it. You, essentially what Julian this is doing is it's creating a scratch org on the backend and deploying all the code that's there in this force app directory. And then what, you know, it, it pushes all those and then it tries to uh, see whether all the dependencies are established. So now, as you can see, it says, you know, uh, it's actually initialized the package creation process. So now you can just run this command and, and you know, at some point, maybe it takes like uh, a couple of more minutes and it will basically say the status. So it's verifying the features and settings. So there are multiple process that happens in the server. Remember that unlike, uh, you know, unlike the package uh, in node where it automatically gets created in the, in the local and then gets just pushed to the package directory. That's not how Salesforce works, right? It has to create a scratch org. It has to deploy everything, make sure everything compiles fine. It has the required test classes uh, and the coverage that we talked about. And then if everything is fine, it will create and it will give you an installation URL you know, and that's what we can use. And now, uh, you know, Julian, just like node packages, right? We also have dependency section where you can actually create the dependencies between different packages. So let's say if somebody oh, publish, nice. yeah, let's say if somebody publishes a, a package, right? They will have to share what we call it as 40 ID. I will show you what is this 40 ID once, uh, you know, the installation URL gets generated. So once the installation URL gets generated, we will have a four, ID, which is just an ID with 040 as the starting prefix. Um, so you can actually use and configure the dependency. Now let me switch back to the slide so that we can cover some slides, Julian, and then probably we can get back and, you know, by that time, I hope that the package creation was successful. Um, so I talked about packaging con context. Now, very important thing to know is, you know, when you're building custom applications, right? And uh, for example, you're not sort of customizing what we give. Let's say you're building an application from the scratch, like, you know, using your own custom objects, your own page layouts, your own metadata there, right? It's a uh, package based development is so helpful because a, it allows you to uh, do a modular application development, similar to what, uh, you know, Julian showed in the node application where it allows you to create your JavaScript code instead of having a one monolithic app, right? You have different, different modules, and then you can configure dependencies between different modules, test these modules individually, release them, right? So it makes very easy, right? And also package based development encourages source driven development. When I say source driven development, that means uh, the source actually resides in GitHub. Like for example, eCars, right? We don't have an org where we have the eCars package. You know, it's all in the Git and you know, you can create a scratch org, test it, enhance the application and then package it, right? So it encourages source driven development. And also it is like build once and deploy anywhere, right? So that's one of the other advantages of uh, packages, Julian, where, you know, we can generate a package and then we can deploy it to any Salesforce org, you know? So it's like build once, and then deploy it, right? And then we can organize our metadata, right? Like for example, it's no more one monolithic, right? And also, uh, Julian, so for easier change management, right? Uh, you know, we can adopt CI CD, which anyways we'll cover in the, in the next session. So there are two types of packages, right? Unlocked and managed packages, right? Again, you know, managed packages are for Salesforce partners who can publish on an app exchange so that you can go to an app exchange and install it, uh, you know, just with a click, right? Um, also with two GP managed packages, you get a lot more features that we provide to, uh, package vendors like license management, uh, you know, managing the, their listing on an app exchange and pricing, right? So all of these comes into, into picture. Think of app exchange as a, as a store, Julian, just like, uh, you know, your Apple store or, uh, you know, Google play store where you can, you know, ex uh, you know, basically you distribute our app as free also as pro profit. And in the unlock packages, Julian, what we created now was an org independent package actually. Uh, 
We have another variation called as org dependent. So in org dependent packages, Julian, let's say you have a massive org already and there's a lot of metadata already there and it is hard for you to actually you know, untangle those dependencies and move them into source control. So for that, we created this version of org dependent where what you can do is you can say, okay, my org is the dependency, you know, instead of saying like my package is the dependency, whatever I have in my org is the dependency, right? So you can create a package and it will only be installed in that org where it resolves all the dependency, you know? So for example, you can have an org which has like five custom objects, right? And your package has only one custom object, but then it depends on those five objects in the org. Then, uh, you know, you don't need to package all those five objects. It can still there be in the org and your one object which depends on these five objects can be in the package, okay? Oh, nice. um, so we created this activity, right? Um, and I want to actually point you out to one of my favorite resource is this trailhead module that I created last uh, year, Julian, where I explain the package application architecture. And one of the things I actually explain is, uh, you know, uh, one of the things I, I love to explain here is how to do the dependencies, right? For example, you know, a package can differ on different, different packages and how to like add those dependencies in your uh, project.json and how to make one package dependent on other packages. So go through this trailhead module and exercises. How about we check Julian where we are with our app, uh, you know, let's, package. Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> let's see what happened, you know. If we did it under the time. There you go. We have the installation. Success. Yeah, we have the installation URL. Yes. So, so Julian, so this is our package version ID, right? The 40 ID that I was talking about, right? And somebody can actually create a dependency section here and have this dependency. Like, let's say you're enhancing. So, so you can have uh, an unlock package depend on a managed package. You can have an unlock package depend on another unlock package, right? Uh, one of the things I did not show was, you know, you can even namespace your package, you know, so that it differentiates you. Uh, but there are some considerations, read through the, the documentation there to understand the considerations for namespaces. Uh, essentially, it will add a namespace to your object, your, your Apex classes and a lot more. And uh, let's say you have already have an object and if you try to namespace it, it will create duplicates object. So all those things needs to be considered uh, before you, you adopt a namespaced package. Okay, so with that, Julian, uh, I think think where are we now okay so now we uh, are almost to our end uh, i think we are almost to our end right so we have some helpful references section here uh in in our uh, you know in our documentation here right um so so go to them i'll share the slides on on the uh, on the chatter group that we have created uh, and also look at our sample app gallery you know it has a lot more code in there look at uh, an example app called easy spaces that shows packaging in more depth it shows different unlock packages how to configure dependencies between them etc uh, and then uh, you know finally catch us on trailblazer community you know leave leave us feedback if you if you like the show uh, give up give a thumbs up if you do not just let us know what we can do to uh, help you deliver uh, amazing content so with that Julian, thank you so much for joining us and thank you everyone for joining this awesome session um Julian, you want to say anything here before we wind up? Well, sure. Please stay tuned. Next week, we will have our last episode of this series, and we are going to learn a lot more. And stay tuned for more content from us. Thank you very much for joining us. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.